Hello there to our full pint patrons and welcome to your exclusive prestigious pints podcast episode. What a mouthful that is. So yes, welcome back to another one of these very special exclusive episodes just for you, our full pint subscribers. Thank you very much for your patronage. This one is including myself and Jeff. We went all the way to New Zealand, well, virtually, to chat with an agile coach that goes back a long way with both of us, that's Sandy Momoli. So we talked about Sandy and how she got started with Agile and very much what's going on on the other side of the world. So it's great to catch up with people in a remote sense from anywhere in the world. It's great to have a, a chat with Sandy. So we hope you enjoy it. Just a reminder that uh, you're still um, entitled to ask us a question through the Ask the Landlord chat function. So make sure you use a uh, check into a patron to, to check that out. And also coming up, we've got a lock-in so keep your eyes peeled for our lock-in night for a drink with me and Jeff. Just a special um, lock-in only episode for you, our patrons, to come and share a pint or a drink of your choice with us. So we hope you enjoy this one. It was a great chat. Here is Jeff and Paul, the full episode, uncut, uh, with Sandy Mamoli. We hope you enjoy. <laughs> Hello, Jeff. Hello, mate. How are you? And hello, Sandy. Cheers. Hello. We're very lucky to uh, have another guest on our prestigious Pints podcast. That's a bit of a mouthful for a for a Tuesday night. Um, oh, but we're very <laughs> we're very um, very pleased to welcome another guest, another prestigious Pint with a with a guest all the way from I'm going to say New Zealand. Am I right? Yes. No. Oh, yes. Yes. See, Jeff, don't doubt me. I thought you moved. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're, well, we're very pleased to have Sandy Mamoli with us today. Um, who's going to well just share a drink with us. We've, we're just discussing that we don't think we've, well, I've certainly not met uh, Sandy in person, so it's nice to meet virtually as well. But we just thought we'd share a pint with you today, um, today or a drink with you at least. But um, Yeah, it's not I'll, a pint. It's, it's, broken, not, it's not a pint really for me, broken I'll, tradition today. I've got a um, a stubby can of um, of pink cider. Are you a fan of cider, Sandy? Do you like a cider, a, an English cider? I do like a cider. I also like English beer. Except for a... <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeff's, G- Jeff's the beer beer expert. I just do cider, and I've got a very limited palate. So, as far as I'm concerned, it's there's, this is like pink sweet apple juice. So it's lovely. But um, orchard pig. There we go. What you got, Jeff? Well, my beer didn't arrive today. I got a text this morning to say my beer was arriving, but it hasn't. I think it's been lost. So, for the first time ever on a podcast in over 100 episodes, I'm having a glass of wine. <laughs> glass of vino. <laughs> oh, yeah. very nice. So, uh, right. you're supposed to swirl, swirl it around, right? Exactly, and tell us how it tastes. It looks like it looks more like Guinness. It's very dark, isn't it? It's, it's, um... it's red wine, yes. Mm. I think it's a Malbec. I think it's from South Africa. That's kind of the, the first criteria for me because the, the first time I really got taught to experience wine, appreciate wine, that's the word, was in South Africa. So I kind of have an, affi- an affinity for, for South African wines. But this is a Malbec, this is a red one, and it smells a bit like cherries. I can't believe we've really gone to, to, so far as to start reviewing wines on this, what was supposed to be a very boozy, beery, um, yeah. Well, no, apparently, we're, we're, I got told I got told my beers were going to be arriving today, but I should be I prepare myself for how they look. I got a message from the company because apparently there's a cardboard shortage in the UK because so many people are ordering stuff to be delivered to home that they're running out of cardboard. So they've packaged it. I think they used the term creatively. <laughs> That's never good, <laughs> is it? But so creatively, I can't see it. But yeah. Enough about me and my lack of beer. Sandy, it's, it's, it's great to have you on. So we, um, this, this series that we're doing, um, we're, we're trying to reach out to people who we have looked up to in the community over the time that we've been involved in it. And even though we've never really met, we, you and I worked together a long time ago on conference tracks and things like this. 
um, I've been very aware of you sometimes sort of being out there on your own if you like on the other side of the world with with not huge amounts of agile coaching community out there uh, and you've been blazing a trail out there as far as I've been concerned for a long time but maybe I don't know do you see it that way not really I know have you heard of that thing called the internet and um yeah. planes <laughs> <laughs> It's actually were, not... you, you, were, you were kind of the first real proper Agile coach on that side of the world that, that we were aware of. Yeah, I was probably one of the, one of the first or um, maybe single-handedly the very first, but probably more one of a group of people where, and it was around like 2007, 2008, where mm -hmm. I think Agile coaching came up or developed worldwide. And... Um, my impression was more it was happening all over the world and quite early on I met people because there was yeah, not, not many people were doing agile coaching or it wasn't even called agile coaching back then mm. around the world and then there were a few people in the UK and a few people in the US and uh, we all started talking to each other and I don't remember exactly what year it was that I heard of you and uh, you wrote your book and uh, we were on conference reviews, um, track reviews. 2012, yeah. 13, around that. Yeah, probably. But, That's 10 years, yeah. almost 10 years ago then. Yeah, probably, yeah. So it's good to kind of meet you face to face. <laughs> yeah. Even though you, you as get as to get. drink wine. And yeah. So yeah, what time is it for you there, Sunday? Now, wherever you are, and I, it looks like from your camp, from your background, I'm gonna. It looks like you're in an office, and that is an, an office is kind of a strange thing for me to be looking at now because I'm kind of forgotten what it looks like to be in an office. <laughs> this is geeky as it might be. This is actually my home with my Kanban boards. Oh but wow! I, I'm just not at the office because it's so early in the morning. It's uh, eight o'clock. I don't show up before 9.30, but I still go to the office basically every day. And um, we, I, my personal experience was that we had like, um, we had a five week lockdown in uh, April. And when it ended, I just decided actually face to face is so much more fun. And um, I don't want to do remote work and I'm super happy and feel really happy and lucky that I get to go to an office. So, so is is it back to I was going to say normal, but it's probably not normal by any stretch. But is it? Does it feel? Is it normal? Yeah. Well, our board. I can't. Well, I could, but our borders are closed, so you couldn't get into New Zealand. If I left New Zealand, it would take me months to get back. Apart from that, um, I use a scanner app when uh, I go, or I scan in on my mobile phone when uh, I go to a restaurant. But that's it. Is it? So it's pretty. I mean, you're still aware of it and people are still tracking it, I suppose, but it's not stopping, um, it's not locking down anything Anything as far as the no. daily. Yeah, no. And we don't have masks and we don't have social distancing or like we've got roughly matches with 40,000 people. And I oh, feel now like you're a, just depressing me. I feel like a dick saying that. <laughs> <laughs> that's I feel so, like a dick and it can be over. So... <laughs> but it... it it seems like it's so far away for, for me right now. That does. That's for, oh, just, but yeah, but I, it's, it's possible. The end, the, there is an end in sight. If that's, I that's can be happy for like. you, Sandy. I can be happy for you. <laughs> You're a much better human being. <laughs> <laughs> has, yeah, has, it, feel... ha, has it changed anything work-wise significantly for, for the companies out there? Um, I think, Everyone has a plan B. Everyone has a business continuity plan that uh, if we go into a lockdown, like New Zealand has an elimination strategy. So as soon as we got um, one case, there's contact tracing. Sometimes uh, then we, we would go into lockdown for like five cases if needed. Mm -hmm. So everyone's aware this could happen tomorrow. And uh, so everyone has a contingency plan what to do mm -hmm. and uh, is able to switch immediately into home working. I think lots of people have started mixing, uh, working from the office and working from home, especially people who have a long commute. They, um, there's a pattern of people being at the office very often three days a week, working from home two days a week. Is um, that not really a thing before then? Not so much. 
No, actually, no. Um, yeah, I my life is uh, I go because I have two. I have work with two clients, and I'm uh, on site, so two days with one, and two days the other one. So for me, it's all office. But most people I know, and with my clients, they uh, do a, a three-two combination. Some people do have four days at the office, one day from home. And I thought it would change much, much more. In the beginning, we're all wow. The world, uh, the world of work has totally changed, and uh, we're never going to go back to the old ways. And we are so productive when uh, we're working from home. And um, I've taught myself that story too, but um, I actually don't mm-hmm. think so. No, I think, and I'm glad in a way that that, that backs up my because um, I'm feeling that at the moment that I'm I need to get back in front of people and I do miss that and it's kind of the reason that I got into agile in the first place is that I do I'm a people person and I get my energy largely from from being in an office type environment and, and experience and being with brown people so I'm glad that I'm not the only one in that respect it's nice to hear no. god no and there's a chance of going back to normal like I was worried that uh, it had changed. I was like, oh, God, everyone really? loves it, and um, I'll be the only one wanting to go back, and there's no point doing that if I'm the only one at the office. So I'm quite happy that people came back to office buildings. So there's hope, yeah. Paul. Well, that's good. Has, I am um, pleased. I am pleased. Has it changed what you're doing with companies from an agile coach perspective? Hmm. No. It hasn't at all, <laughs> actually. It's again the um, working from home is harder. I think, especially as an agile coach, where you actually get to observe people, you get to overhear conversations, and mm. where um, it's all about. I find it hard to build relationships because everything has to be a meeting if you are mm. uh, working from home. So um, going back, it has actually not changed anything. Um, People are – one thing maybe that is uh, people are more technology savvy. The um, Everyone knows how to start a Zoom call or a Teams call. And um, if you need to talk to someone on a day where you aren't there, you just jump on and uh, have a call. That makes it easier. But I think nothing really big has changed. So were your, the two clients that you're working with now, were you working with them before the pandemic started? Um. One of them, yes, and one, no. So was it easier or harder or about the same to, to get that new client started, you know, that new client relationship started? Yeah. Um, don't forget that um, our pandemic has been over since May. So I don't think you'll was... let me forget that. <laughs> no, just rub it in. <laughs> May? May was la- last year. Oh, my days. Yes. Incredible. I'm rubbing it in and I give you every right that uh, <laughs> you didn't. So that, so that, that was here. a relevant question. Yeah. So we'll, we'll cut that so I don't table. look so stupid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll, yeah, we'll edit, edit this to make Jeff not look so silly there. But, so, people, uh, that's something yeah, people have asked me in that you know, if I was just, I was lucky last year in that I was working with a, a, a client that I've been with for a while and we had that relationship, we had that understanding, we knew each other, we, um, we had that trust and rapport. And so actually being able to move remotely wasn't too much of a challenge for us but if I was to start with a new client that would be I think would be really tough mm. yeah. I haven't we haven't managed like uh, I'm part of a company we have 14 people and uh, when lockdown happened last year we kept most of our existing clients or the ones we lost were all the tourism industries like uh, airports and so on were gone immediately uh, kept existing ones, as you said, uh, switched to remote and um, didn't get any new clients at all because um, it wasn't possible to build any relationships. Is that what you I were seeing? Sorry. That's all right. Well, I don't, I don't, I honestly don't know, but I don't know whether it's, I don't know whether it's because those companies aren't doing as well or they're being a little bit more cautious with their spend or, or, or what, whether they're just trying to do things on their own. I don't know. Do I was you... wondering if, sorry, Sandy. Um, I was wondering if the, because um, it was a, obviously a shorter, in New Zealand from what you're describing, so a shorter um, period where that remote, um, that remote element became um, the way of working. You said it ended since last May. 
obviously we we've here we feel like i mean it feels like 10 years that we've been going through this already but um, it's obviously probably nearer 10 months to be honest but i wonder whether that bounce back whether the bounce back will be easier because we've been remote for less you know for less time and we'll find it easier then to bounce back into oh it's like it never happened kind of thing it's back to normal i think personally in this country jeff i don't know if you're the same but i think it's got to be a lot tougher to bounce back to where we were so quickly social distancing i think will be um a habit now that people will be used to i don't think it will just all of a sudden step into the office and people will forget i don't think it will happen that quickly well, it's interesting Sandy, you said that you don't have masks I, I was chatting to a friend of mine who runs a gp surgery here and so this is normally flu season and literally flu rates are at zero percent are they Wow. Zero to Because everyone's percent. wearing a mask. And they're not going out, they're not socialising. Yeah. Um, so effectively, flu this season has been eradicated. And he was talking about how that's a massive message for society that can't be ignored. Um, his prediction is that even if there's no coronavirus, masks is something that would get people through the flu season. So he sees masks staying here. Don't know. You look at most Asian countries where um, mm. people wear a mask when they have a cold. So mm. it might be yeah. actually a good thing. And I also realised that uh, with you having dealt with this for such a long time, there's actually a chance that um, you might learn something, whereas we just like, oh, this was tough, cool, yeah, move on, back to normal. <laughs> so I'm not sure if yeah. back to normal is so great. Well, I don't know. You, it seems like you, you have... Learn something. I mean, from a from a country, would you say New Zealand? I think New Zealand probably has a greater level of. No, that's not. I'm not going to finish that sentence. But I, I'm thinking. Yeah, you've had earthquakes. You've had all sorts of different things that, as a country, you, you tend to bounce back from. So you have a, a significant amount of resilience built in it, into your culture. I would say. Is that fair? I, yes, I think so. Um, probably. I think what was different was that this felt more um like it was it was affecting everyone mm. whereas um earthquakes some people were a lot more affected than others like mm. in Auckland I wasn't affected by an earthquake in Christchurch that much but this felt like we had this messaging of uh, like a team of five million and there was social cohesion uh that I think helped with that resilience mm. you've actually got quite a lot of different cultural experiences right you've lived in lots of different countries is that right have you also worked as as in, a, in the agile space in different countries yeah so how would you maybe you've probably been asked this many times before but how would you sort of summarize the differences in in, in cultures that you've seen oh, interesting question the um i think my original work culture is Danish. And um, if you take that as a baseline, then um, New Zealand is quite hierarchical. And I know that it's not compared to other countries, but compared to Scandinavia, it is, which mm. um, you can feel when um, working an agile way. It's uh, I found it a lot easier introducing agile and working an agile way in Scandinavia than New Zealand. But again, comparing that to Austria, where I've also worked, um, New Zealand is a um, super flat hierarchy and um, <laughs> and um, people yeah, a, lot, a lot flatter and a lot uh, more pragmatic in uh, Austria. So there's a lot more rules in Austria and how you're supposed to do things. Um, but yeah, I, I do like working in all those different cultures and it's still kind of small only three countries i've never worked in the uk where where would you put the uk like somewhere around austria more like uh, new zealand yeah I'm, i don't know i mean i, I think it, i don't I think feel it must qualified give, to say but i oh, think oh. it must give you do you find sandy that you have to we were actually this came up in a class i was teaching just today but do you find that you have to adjust or you can, you find it easy to adjust your style based on that experience, based on how you've seen different um, cultures and different organizations, different countries, and how people react differently to the same type of question. Oh, 
Absolutely. Um, and that goes down to like everyday language where um, I translate. Mm. I, I speak to a friend in Austria or Denmark and I tell them, hey, um, I want to leave. See ya. If I do this in New Zealand, I go, I let you go. It means the same thing, but you say it in a very different yeah. way. I let you go versus I want to leave. And um, I can just switch. And the same goes for how yeah, to explain good... agile or work. Did you have, did you learn that the hard way, or was it, did it always come naturally? Oh yeah, I oh, sense yeah. a story behind some of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was more the um, totally oblivious person who didn't have a story, but I think everyone around me in New Zealand knew that I was just the road European. <laughs> and I, was, I think they were mainly talking about me. Um, I, I had no idea. I thought it might. I was perfectly fair to say this is a bad idea, which. I would say in Denmark and um, in New Zealand, I wrap it in into um, hard skip thinking and um, how um, I appreciate the thought, but uh, how I ultimately believe this, we should consider other options. Whereas uh, in Austria or Denmark, I just go, I think it's a really dumb idea and that's fine. <laughs> they can be a lot more direct. Yes, so but you're saying the same thing. a chance that you have a better is there a chance that you have a better signal anywhere else in your house just you're breaking up quite a bit i can open the door and see i'll just go closer to the router and hope um there is no dog barking <laughs> what kind of dog you got uh a mix of everything it's um <laughs> A brown um, 27 kilo dog. That's a mix of Border Collie, American Pit Bull, Australian Cattle Dog, yeah, Staffy, and eight more things. Wow. Did yes, you say geez. 27 kilos? Yep. <laughs> it's not a tiny dog. That's quite big. I was going to say, that's quite big for a dog. <laughs> that's a small child in, in, my, in, my, uh, in my eyes. Yeah. What's, what's 27 kilos? It's probably <laughs> as demanding as a child. Yeah, I can imagine. Do any of you have dogs? <laughs> I th you don't do, Paul. No, no, we've no. got a rabbit, two rabbits and, a, and four fish. That's as far as we've gone. I think Paul and I are the only two households in the whole of the UK that don't have a dog now. It seems it's that been during, a massive increase, hasn't there? A massive increase yeah. in people buying dogs during lockdown. The price of dogs and also the amount of stolen dogs has gone through the roof because yeah. people have, they want something to do in their houses, <laughs> something to lift the gloom, but also an excuse to get out of the house. And a puppy is a good thing. It makes total sense. I guess all of a sudden you have uh, nothing else to do. Uh, it's really nice going on a walk and uh, yeah. I'd probably get a dog too. So how far away are you? But it is, it is good you? for, I think. How far are you is, from um, getting a dog? For your mental health. Oh, no, no one near, no one near. I've, I've been working on my wife for 20 years to get a dog and uh, she, she refuses to get one. I think the fact that we've gone through a year of lockdown and the whole of the country getting a dog and we haven't got one, I think is a really strong message that that's, that ship has sailed. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think we decided, mm -hmm. we decided halfway through the first lockdown. We, I mean, we, I think we probably gave it a fair bit of consideration. Like it, it was a, a reasonably sensible family meeting that we had about dogs. And then I think, I think my wife got bitten by a dog or some, something like that. It was, she was out running. She, my wife's quite went into running. And the dog jumped at her and kind of nipped her, and that put her off. That's it. That was it. That was no. That was the no dog moment in our house. Yeah, and also I think the uh, it'd be really nice now, but the pandemic is probably over in a year when everyone's vaccinated. So at some point, we go back to a different kind of life, and the dog you're going to have them for ten years. Yeah, that is true. We um this came up today. This is a bit of an aside here, but um it was an interesting conversation. I did some I did a training course today. I did um day one of a training class, and um 
the subject of defining done came up and um i thought we were about we were approaching on coffee break and um i said well let's let's make this into an exercise and i said write down quite quickly on a post-it on a albeit a virtual post-it on a board what what does a good break look like you're about to have a, a short break and the number of people that wrote down um either stroke the cat or uh, stroke the dog pet the dog uh, stroke the rabbit the number of people that wrote down some kind of pet interaction mm. and i'm seeing more cats now online than i ever have seen the, the cats that or cats or dogs that that bark or or um or meow or walk into shop i think it's on the increase but i, I don't think necessarily that's a bad thing because i think they do provide some sense of, of calming yeah, mindfulness absolutely they do and i think it's a cool thing that you see everyone's cats and dogs and um, online, it makes people kind of more interesting. And also, I love the idea of the, yeah, write down what uh, what a good break looks to you. That's um, <laughs> it's a really cool idea. It was, yeah. There was lots of things around, um, yeah, getting outside, uh, tea, coffee, a nice stretch. Someone said, reset the back. And I had to ask what that meant, reset, but apparently it was a, it was a, back, a back thing, a back issue. Um, but yeah, reset the back, go outside, move around, read a page of a book. Someone said, meditate. Someone else said, and there you go. That's what a good I'm break looks link, like these days. I'm going to link those last two things, and I'm going to come back to you again, Sandy, on this one because you've got more practical experience on this than me. But so, animals and culture. So, I've worked at clients in the UK where they've had dogs in the office. Uh, so people can bring the dog in and they can... Uh, I've been teaching or facilitating or coaching in a, in a, in a work room and the dog's just walked in. Uh, and I love dogs, so it's fine. Um, but I wouldn't see that in, let's say, um, Germany. That just I just would never see that in Germany. And I've seen teaching in Scandinavia, a number of people bring their babies to the, to, to the training class. Um, and I wouldn't see that in England. And I don't, I see a lot of animals on Zoom calls in England, but I don't see a lot of animals on Zoom calls with people who are in other countries. And I think that's, that's an indication of, of culture, maybe vulnerability, maybe professionalism. I don't know, that, that kind of interpretation. So you've, you've actually worked in these countries. Would you say that's a signal? I think, I think totally. I think totally. And uh, yes, I really like the thought and it's a really cool observation. I can also share the observation about the same countries. Like uh, I wouldn't see dogs in the office in Austria, um, no. maybe in a startup. But um, I'd really I'd sometimes see them in New Zealand. That's uh, of smaller companies could have dogs in the office. And uh, I see lots of animals on, uh, on Zoom calls. Um, Scandinavia, you're right, babies. You can take a baby anywhere. <laughs> and uh, I haven't seen that that much in New Zealand, which is also weird because um, Scandinavia has really good childcare. Mm. Mm. I noticed it at conferences. I think it was in a yeah, Scandinavian j- j- conference. About a nine month old, is it? Yeah, there was a yeah. Um, someone brought in there, was basically carrying a baby in a yeah, in a sling around, you know, an open space, I think it was. Papoose. Hmm. Oh, yes. Papoose, that's the one. Good word, good use of the word papoose. Yeah. Yeah. Which now, country have you worked in? Which, none. No, I mean, I, I, little bits, so I'll go for a couple of days or a week at a time, but I still live in the town that I was born in. What is Jeff, that, doesn't, Jeff doesn't get out much. <laughs> no, it's a town. It's not even a city. It's a hundred miles away from London, but it's a oh. lovely place. How many people? Hmm. Just you. Sixty thousand. I'm going to Google it. Oh, nice. <laughs> What's the population? I reckon we've got more. Um, more non-residents than we have residents. Cheltenham, Wikipedia. Oh, 115,000. There you go. There you go. Apparently. Double, double what I thought. 
but you've traveled. I mean, Jeff, you've traveled a bit. You've seen, like you say, you may not have been in places for a long time or done long stints, but you've seen yeah. different places, different companies. So I've done weeks at a time in Switzerland or America or um, South Africa or something like that. But um, you know, never actually. And I think you don't really see things unless you're there for a period of time and you're paying bills and you're doing chores rather than living in a hotel. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And deal with bureaucracy and you don't get the, um, and people stop being nice to you because you're this interesting foreigner because at some point you stop being interesting and Mm -hmm. you just, Better fit in. I'll take your word talking. for it. I've never stopped being interesting, Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> never had that problem. <laughs> Shit. Uh, neither, of course, neither. <laughs> just, just you, just you. Just you, yeah. <laughs> just... <laughs> I know, but um, I've never been interesting. It's a tough life. Ah, uh, you, you say that. Well, I read some. Gonna... I read on your profile, Sunday, that you were you're a former Olympian. But I write my own profile, so of course it's interesting. <laughs> she's also she's also a liar. <laughs> <laughs> a liar yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought it sounded good. <laughs> Track or field? Um, I don't know. Indoor court, handball. Oh, you wouldn't know what handball, handball is. Yeah. Do you know? No, you don't know. Like yeah. team I, I'm hand- sure I've seen it. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure I've seen it. It's quite, isn't it? Quite rough. Quite physical, isn't it? Yeah, that's the cool thing about it. It's like rugby on a hard on a hard surface, <laughs> from what I've seen. Yep, pretty much. But you don't get to tackle people from behind, so you just yeah, tackle okay. them from the front or side. So that evens out out the uh, the hard surface. But it's a super and, cool and how sport. Did that, how did you get on with that? Get on with that. Um, I had a miss about yeah. you. Uh, being a complete sports jock, and um, I went to uh, a boarding school for um, athletes, and then at some point I got pretty good at it, and I uh, went to a few World Cups and um, the Olympics in '92, which was actually a shitload of work, and um, it was my entire life. And I only stopped because I realised at some point I needed to grow up. <laughs> so, so when did you stop was, playing? Ninety two was Barcelona. Was Barcelona it? was it? Barcelona? Yeah, Is that right? yeah, that was Barcelona. Yeah, yeah. I stopped a bit like um, I've Pretty seen good. two. Yeah, yes. And um, yeah, I think it was Placid Domingo playing there. Yeah, it was cool. That was the. I always remember that opening cer- ceremony when, because it was the archer that fired the, fired the um, the flame yes. into the torch, and I was like, I, I, I was like looking at the TV like, oh, that's amazing, that's amazing. So you were there. Were you in the? Um, were you in the? Um, in the main opening ceremony? Oh, yes. That's yep. cool. That's a cool story. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. That's a cool story. Yeah, I do miss those days that were cool but I, I don't think I could work that hard anymore so what was it that how how did it stop was it injury or was it just was it how, what, how did you move away from from that sport I couldn't really get any further the um I it was my goal to go to the Olympics and we finished fifth which was um actually a bit of a disaster because we we're, were the big favorites but I I can invest another four years, and I can um, I can work on uh, getting gold, but uh, I didn't want to. Um, I also was uh, around 22. New, I've seen too many people who turn 35, uh, start working in a pizza shop, and which is totally okay if that's what you really want, but they didn't. Yeah. So uh, having no education, and you live well if you are a professional handball player, but it's not like tennis where you never have to work in, again in your life. So um, yeah, great yeah, life yeah, yeah. while you're active, but you can't, you don't, you come yeah. out with a few savings, so you can finance your studies yeah. afterwards, but you're not rich. Mm. So I just you know, I mm. changed something, went to uni, got a yeah, 
degree in computational linguistics. And um, yeah, also moved to Denmark, got a professional contract there where I played um, like not at an Olympic level, but um, kind of being paid without being world class and studying at the same time. <laughs> yeah, awesome. And was it then a straight leap from from your degree or from your education straight into agile or was it was it a, was there another stepping stone that led you down towards more agile path almost i think i had a um i had two years with a uh, consultancy that um did uh, where i was a, a junior programmer and they um sold the uh, specification document and then the design document and then the implementation phase and uh, it was this great idea that the client you could just specify everything and then the client could uh, have this document and they could always find a different provider and I thought it was great and made complete sense until I actually tried it mm. and uh, it didn't go that well. <laughs> And then I somehow ended up um, working with um, uh, Sony Ericsson, and around 2003, we just started working in an agile way. I thought everyone was doing it. I thought it was completely normal. I didn't even know really it was a big deal. And um, after, and then in 2006 or seven, I moved to New Zealand and realised that uh, I, I've been living in a bubble. <laughs> It hit home when you moved to Zealand, New Zealand, did it? Sorry? Yeah, totally, yeah. Now, that's when uh, nobody was interested yeah. in this agile thing and, uh, yeah, what the hell is this? Actually. So it was initially a hard, hard sell and when you hit New Zealand. It, when it was, a, a, you know, it was relatively new. No one was doing it. Tough, tough, um, tough area to move into. Yes, there was basically nothing to move into. There were a few people around the country who uh, had tried Agile, who, uh, a lot of them foreigners, who didn't want to go back to the old ways of working. But there was a lot of ads, it's never going to work, and uh, we don't actually want to do that. And I yeah. remember going, yeah, I don't care about everyone else, but uh, I'm just not going to work in this old way. And started creating my own small worlds, and that's basically how I became a coach. That's great. So, uh, from what Where I've seen, again, New Zealand yeah, is in terms of agile maturity, Sandy. Um, I think actually not that bad. I think we're probably uh, behind Sweden, but ahead of a lot of other countries. I think what's good about New Zealand is that people are quite good at, as we say, give it a go, try something out. Mm. And um, our companies are not uh, giga enormous. So we get to play with uh, companies that if there are a few thousand people, which is easier, or 500 people, which I think is easier than um, the 10,000 or 20,000 people or companies that you find in the US. Um, and then there are companies that are like amazingly agile, and then there are companies where they're like, "Oh, you never do anything that even resembles agile," and that's okay too. So, yeah. I don't think we are um, behind. I think we're actually um, quite good, but we have a uh, quite of a different. Um, we have different companies, so we don't have the the huge ones. So there's very little experience here in uh, how to run a ten thousand people company. Mm. So you don't have the same level of sort of scaling challenges that that a lot of the other countries that you've worked in have. Yes and no. Um, we have them, but I think they're not real. There's this funny thing about. New Zealanders, when um, like sometimes I go to companies and they say, well, we need to scale and we want to do safe. And I go, okay, so how many teams do you have? And they go, well, three. So there's a lot of um, companies thinking they're big because they're big by New Zealand standards. Three is even not, not even big by New Zealand standards. But they read the same things in New Zealand. They're super interesting, interested in what's going on in the rest of the world. And um, I think there's a little bit of a complex even to uh, get all the knowledge they possibly can. And then sometimes – and they learn a lot. And then sometimes misapplying it to mm. something, something that's made for 10,000 people like John Deere, like SAVE, to um, try to implement it at their uh, 70-people company. 
there's no need for. So uh, to your question, so do you find I think yourself we, actually talking people out of scaling? Yes. Yes. Um, but mainly like a couple of years ago, that uh, it was the whole rage. Scaling was the whole rage. And um, that has gone away, I think. Mm. I haven't heard that for a while. Have you? Is that a thing in the UK at the moment? Yeah, I think that's probably fair. I, I think it's, I think it's, um, there was a very, a, 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 a big marketing campaign. Maybe it was deliberate. Maybe it was accidental. I don't know. But Safe was certainly running riot. Um, <laughs> that's a terrible word, but but there were had a strong um, push in the UK. Probably, obviously pre-COVID, but maybe two, three years ago. I imagine they were quite. It was it was quite it was everywhere, and it was cool to be for a company to be thinking safe, and it was you know, it was very much seen as almost surpassed Scrum in many respects. But I think that's. If anything, that's tapered off a bit now. I think um, we're hearing about more bespoke scaling efforts and and more, um, you know, much more uh, emergent evolutionary approaches to, to to dealing with this. Is less of a people talking about it less now. Yeah. No pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> nice pun. But yeah, I think same here. <laughs> So I think yeah. what age has, ta has uh, taught me is sometimes those waves, as annoying as they might be, you can just write them out. Okay, yeah. Mm. It'll go away a little bit. But it is it's, w the thing we've um, we've mentioned on previous podcasts that Jeff and I have done. It is it's it's a bit of a special year this year because it is it's twenty years. It doesn't seem like twenty years that um, since the manifesto was written, but. Um, and me and Jeff would have been in BT perhaps after five years, if we were, you know, 2005, maybe 2006, probably talking to ourselves thinking, this is never going to last. We need, there'll be something else in the next, next, next 12 months, next two years. But amazingly, it's still, you know, there's still people talking about it now and still people. Do you find there's still people that you would meet or coach in New Zealand that are still relatively unaware of this whole agile thing? Yes. And it, it surprises me every single time. The um, like most people have heard of it, and most people know something, but there are still people who don't know anything, which is interesting. And um, mm. the other type of fight is the what I struggle actually with uh, a lot more is that uh, the the people who think they know agile, but their understanding is so different from what. Uh, now I think I'm in possession of the truth, but what I believe agile is. Mm. basically scrum by the numbers and that kind of stuff but yeah mm. it's kind of shocking that it's 20 years old mm. it's crazy isn't it it is bonkers it really is bonkers what's been your favorite bit of the last 20 years that's one of those questions where um from the interview side the question is amazing and from uh the victim side you go shit 20 years <laughs> 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 oh, I don't know the best thing in Agile for the last 20 years I think it's um, I could have said 15 but hey yeah, oh, they would have, oh 15 well I can tell you that <laughs> I think it's actually um, I think the best thing is uh, seeing um, Agile not just taking place in um, individual pockets or teams, but um, that uh, there are people around it who create entire environments where um, there's agile thinking and uh, that um, just enjoy trying things out and um, enjoy pushing boundaries and experimenting. I think when you get that, that's amazing. And I've got it maybe once or twice, but uh, I think for me that has been the best thing working with uh, an e-commerce company in um, New Zealand called Trade Me, where I get to try all that stuff, including self-selection, including um, being agile everywhere. Um, I enjoy trying out things that haven't been tried before, and they're usually based on um, existing agile um, ideas and um, philosophies. So long-winded answer, I think that has been the best thing for me 
your turn. Can you remember some of the things that you tried and you, you at the time you were thinking, oh my God, is this really going to work? I'm really nervous. And actually looking back, you think, what, what was I worried about? <laughs> I think the biggest one was actually doing self-selection with uh, 200 people. Okay. I have no idea if this is going to work. Um, no one has published anything about how to do this. Um, we need to figure this out ourselves. It seems like a good idea. It seemed like a good idea at the time, but we're doing this now, and actually we're in completely uncharted territory. And um, if it doesn't work, there's something really nice about living in New Zealand, or there used to be, which is um, if you have more than one passport, it's like, okay, if it goes all wrong, I've got an Austrian passport in my back pocket, I just spin it and move back to Europe. <laughs> and to be honest, I'm actually um, any client I work with, I'm pretty scared or nervous to start working with because I don't know what's going to work for them. I don't know if this is doable. I don't know if I can do it, if I can make real change. And um, so, and that's also what's uh, what's exciting about what I do. But um, I think the scary, it's scary every single time. Maybe I'm just because this is your um, again. I, I tried to I, I tried to do a bit of research here, Sandy. I, I, I'll admit I tried to tried to do a good thing and do some research. But this is your book, right? You've co-authored a book on self-selection, is that right? Yeah. Bit of a plug there, but a bit of a clang. But go with me on it. Nice. So can you just give us get a quick overview about what that's what that's for for any of our listeners that don't know what's what's that all about? Um, so the book's basically a how-to, and it's um, how to get people into teams. And the traditional way of getting people into teams is that you've got managers deciding uh, who goes where. And we flipped that on its head yeah. going, well, we know that people, um, people know best who they should work with and what they should work on. So why can't we just give them um, a big challenge and go, hey, the company needs those number of teams – you tell us who should be in which team. So we created a whole facilitation uh, way of facilitating that so it doesn't go off the rails and uh, nobody ends up crying or in fights, but people have grown up conversations and um, figure it out. And the book is a guide and a how to um, get that done, both if you have um, yeah. relatively few teams, like four or five, to um, up to like um, 15, 20 teams. Okay. So what, what would you say is, because I know a couple of companies that have done it and I, I know that a couple of um, instances where they've, and they, now they, they've done it and they swear by it because it's transformed how they've, it's taken so much the, of the pressure away from managers and management to form the teams. And once they tried it once, it was that successful. They, they just do it every time now. It's, it just makes complete sense. Why wouldn't you do it that way? So I think yeah, it's a it's um it's a great technique. But what so what are would you say are the if you were to give a couple of tips that you think are, are essential to to facilitate it because it is quite scary to facilitate if you haven't done it before. What would you say and any any advice would be if you are thinking about doing that, taking that step? I think be really really clear around your boundaries. The um, from a management point of view. What happens if people don't end up in the team you thought they were going to end up or you wanted them to end up? Um, will you be prepared to go with that? Because if the answer is no, then don't do a self-selection. Then just do an honest management selection. So make sure that's clear. Be really transparent around any constraints when you facilitate the, um, I don't know, uh, max team size, for example, or like I've made the mistake that we um, we had a team that we didn't want to spend a lot of um, budget on. It's like this is probably a max three people, but assume nobody would want to be there anyway. Eight people wanted to be there. So we had to then say, mm. oh, by the way, we mm. that was the point. So be really clear around those constraints. And the third one is mm. let it be a real self-selection don't meddle with it. Don't um, introduce additional things like uh, that number of senior developers and that number of uh, junior developers. Or oh, okay. That. People saw it. Just I wouldn't so do that, that. So not too many constraints around it. Then you've got to give some freedom to it. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah. And no, uh, you need to have that kind of domain knowledge or been in a company for that long. Nothing like it just makes it more complex and um, it will hide solutions. Because yeah, that that's how I've seen this. This, Yeah, that's how I've seen this particular company do it. And it worked quite well. I mean, I think they had to, they certainly put constraints, but they did put kind of um, senior, junior, graduate kind of, each team has to have those things. But you'd say pro- maybe don't do that then. I think what they did is better than not doing it. But uh, I think, yeah, uh, I wouldn't do it because I think people usually, like it, it assumes that a senior developer equals a senior developer and an intermediate developer, an intermediate developer, and they don't. Mm. So I think if they find any way to achieve that purpose, let them be whatever combination they want to be. And if it's five grads who you know are not going to pull it off, you question them as a facilitator, like really – are you sure you can deliver to purpose? Are you sure that's what's best for the company? What are you um, What are you hoping for for the for the future, Sandy? From a from a from an agile perspective. Uh, good question. I think what I noticed is um, I would like to have. I'd love to see a back to the basics. I'd love to see things like uh, extreme programming come back. I'd love to see some of the um, original ideas come back and I think that's because we we have a new generation of people and they're building on old ideas and uh, at some point so much time has passed that they don't even know about the old original ideas anymore and um, this sounds like the old person you need to know your mm. history but um, I I was I, this, I was an adult 2019. And there was a room full of people, and the presenter asked, so who knows uh, the book, um, Great Retrospectives by um, Esther Derby and Diana Larson? And three people put up their hands. And um, that showed me, hey, there's some really, really good stuff that people would actually benefit from uh, from reading. And um, there are some really good ideas that um, are getting lost and I think it's not so much a uh, know your history because I personally don't care about um, what happened in Utah anymore. But I think there's some good ideas, and um, especially in extreme programming, that I'd love to um, see not forgotten and come back. I guess my back to the future. Yes. Yeah. Keep the philosophy intact and the ideas, and I hope they don't get corrupted. There's a bit of a danger at the moment. Cool. Yeah. What, what's your hopes? Um, we had um, we had a chat with Mike Mike Cohn a while ago, and he said he wants Agile to disappear. And I I kind of you know I don't really talk a lot of, when I'm talking to leadership teams now. I don't really talk too much about Agile. I, I talk to talk to them about coherence and resilience. I mean, even before the pandemic, we were talking about resilience. Um, and Agile is a is a tool to become more resilient in certain circumstances. Um, so you know, I, I think that's that's kind of where where I, I, I'm on the same sort of page there. In that, I want to stop having the conversation about agile, if that makes sense. Mm. Yep. Yep. Do you? But my immediate hope is to get out of goddamn lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get through this pandemic first. But if any, if anything, it's um. If, if anything, the pandemic, I'm, I'm trying to, to um, look at it as a, in a positive. I'm trying to do a big positive thing at the moment, Sandy. I'm trying to, the way I'm trying to help me and my family get through this is, is, to, to, is to try and pull a positive out of everything. And I found it easier to, to, to explain what complex problems are. If, if anything, this pandemic's taught me is it's easier to help give people a real life example of what com- complexity is all about. The solution, nobody knows the way out of this in this country yet. And I'm not speaking for you in New Zealand, but in this country yet, nobody really knows the, how this is going to end. And that's a scary thing. But from an agile perspective, that's kind of what you'd expect. So it gives it gives um, it's given me a nice way to to frame it as a positive thing. But um, yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, it's got to be a this, it's got it's got to be a journey for, for, for sure, certainly. Yes, yeah. Um, well, on on the whole, on the whole journey, you know, I think that's something that we're 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 aiming for. We want to be that would be my de- my my definition of done. My acceptance criteria is that we can we can go to New Zealand. 
it's still and, and this is perhaps um, a false hope but this was New Zealand was always a place that me and my wife thought wouldn't it be great to live there and I don't know if that's because we went there on holiday it probably is a lot to do with that but um there's part of us that still thinks oh it'd be nice to live, be in New Zealand now it would be nice to be a, you know, to be able to live in New Zealand or to to work in New Zealand but you know it's um, it's it still holds because I was I was traveling around New Zealand in 20 no 2008 I did a tour around New Zealand so a part of my heart I think I left there because I, I was yearning to go back I promised that I'd take my kids back there one day so that's that's the hope yeah like any countries there's really good stuff and there's also really annoying things but um mm. I'd love it if you moved to New Zealand it'd be um it'd be great it'd be great fun you'd get over the annoying stuff and um yeah yeah as soon as you can come over um I'll be your guide Brilliant. Whereabouts in New Zealand are you? In Auckland? I'm in Auckland, yeah. Okay. Yes. Lovely, lovely part of the world. Yeah. What do we have to say? I'll let you go or I want to go. Yeah. What do we have to say? You have to let you let me go. <laughs> I will let you go. I'll let you go now. Okay, I'll let you go now, Sandy. <laughs> I'll let you go now too. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great to see you and, and speak to you. Thanks, Sandy. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Cool to talk to you. Cheers. Cheers. Cool.